welcome to lesson 11 of the Deeper Christian Bible Study Series in the book of Ephesians. Today we are focusing on Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5. Now as a review, Paul is talking in verses 3 through 14 about the countless blessings that we have in God. And again, in verses 3 through 6, we are talking specifically about the blessings that we have in the Father. But yet you have to remember, every blessing finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. So let me read this, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 through 5. Paul says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons to himself through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will. Paul says that you have been predestined by God for adoption. Now, the word predestined, it's very interesting. It's two Greek words put together. It's the word before and then the word determine. In other words, it's this idea of to determine beforehand. Well, in other words, adoption is the ultimate plan of God for humanity. Now, when you look back at the story of Adam and Eve in the garden, what you begin to see is that God was longing for a relationship, that he would walk with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day, and that their destiny, that their purpose in life was that they were to showcase the life of God to the entire world. Ian Thomas said it this way, that Adam and Eve was to be the visible representation of the invisible. That what was going on is here is God, the invisible, but yet he wants himself to be seen. So he created a visible man and woman to really showcase the invisible through their life. Do you know what you and I are supposed to be? You and I are supposed to be the visible representation of the invisible. That you and I are to showcase Jesus Christ. But due to sin, we are unable to live in a relationship and showcase the invisible through the visible. That we are born in sin and under the legal authority of the enemy. But think about this. In the midst of our rebellion and our sin, as we were shaking our fist in God's face, the Bible declares that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And as 2 Peter 3, 9 says, but God is patient with us because he does not want any to perish, but all to come to repentance. See, it is God's desire that he has determined beforehand. It's, it's his passion. It's his, it's his consumption that we would be adopted as children of God. See, he has a burn, a desire, and a longing for you to be his child, for you to be adopted. Now, adoption obviously is an incredible thing, and I would encourage you to even consider an actual adoption. It is, is a beautiful picture of the redemption of Jesus. But you need to understand that when Paul's talking about adoption, he's talking about adoption in the midst of a Roman world, and he seems to be hinting at the Roman understanding of adoption. So let me describe that to you. Now, if a Roman was going to go through the process of adoption, uh, as, as you probably know, Romans love ceremonies. They love the pomp and the glamour and the glory. So they would have a ceremony. And they would use a symbolic cell in which copper and scales were used. So they would bring the scale, they would bring the copper, and they would sell the child. Now again, it's symbolically, but it's for the sake of the ceremony. So what would happen? The biological father would go and they, he would sell his son to the new father, and then he would buy him back. And then he would sell his son a second time and buy him back. But on the third time, as he sold his son, he knew that it was the final time and that he would never be able to buy his son back again. That if he sold his son a third time, psh, this is final. This is, hey, this is forever. This is, I cannot come back and say, well, just kidding. So they would do it three times. Now, the new father at this point would plead the case of the adoption before one of the principal Roman magistrates. And as he pleaded the case, oh, I want the son. Oh, please let me have the son. And hey, I, I paid the fees. And hey, I've gone through all the paperwork. And hey, I've done all that stuff. At that point, the adoption was final. Now get this. 
The individual who was being adopted had all the rights of a legitimate son in the new family. Oh, isn't that amazing? And he completely lost all rights to his old family. So in the eyes of the law, in the Roman law, he was a brand new person. So new, in fact, that even all of his old debts and all of his old obligations that, that was connected to his previous family were abolished as if they had never existed. Isn't that an amazing thought? Now, something else to kind of tie into this is this idea of the father's power. See, in the Roman world, the father had all the authority and all the power. As Roman historian Dio Cassius once wrote, he said, the law of the Romans gives a father absolute authority over his son, and that for the son's entire life. It gives a father authority, if he so chooses, to imprison his son, to scourge him, to make him work on his estate as a slave in chains, or even to kill him. The right still continues to exist, even if the son is old enough to play an active part in political affairs, even if he's been judged worthy to occupy the magistrate's office, and even if he is held in honor by all men. Think about this. God has predetermined in his love, with a passionate zeal and desire, to adopt you as his child. He has gone through all the legal proceedings of the cross in order to free you from the penalty and the power of sin and to bring you in, not to wash floors and be a mere servant, but to be a son or a daughter of the king of the universe. You, your old family, no longer has any hold on you. You are not what you once were. You are a brand new person. Which is why Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.17 can declare, Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away. Look, all things have become new. Isn't that an amazing thought? That in Jesus Christ, as you've been adopted as a child of God, hey, your old life, your old, hey, all your old sin, all your old, hey, everything that used to define you in the past no longer defines you. What defines you? the family of the new. Oh, isn't that amazing? You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. And get this, and you have all the rights of a legitimate child in the family. And the father's power and governance over your life is still true. Do you realize that that Roman picture of a father is so much more true with, with, with our heavenly father? See, he is now to have absolute authority over your life, to do as he pleases, just as the Roman father had power over their children. But get this, this is not something to fear, it's something to delight in, because we have a good, loving, and gracious God as our father. Oh, I just love that. It's interesting to me that Paul calls Jesus the prototype, or really, the word that he uses is the first fruits. But what does that mean for you and I? See, as a legitimate child of God, you now have access to what Jesus had access to. See, the intimacy that Jesus had with the Father, you now can have. The same indwelling life of the Holy Spirit that sourced the life of Jesus is the same indwelling Holy Spirit that lives inside you as a child of God. Do you realize that you can walk in freedom and victory and triumph? Why? Because you are a child of the King. You can live with love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Why? Because you're a child of the King. And His life is to become your life. Oh, that is so amazing to me. Mm, that's just so, I love that. Do you realize that there are several realities to this idea of adoption? Let me just run through them really quickly. But as you just ponder this idea of adoption, all these realities come true. Do you realize that you have moved from death unto life? You were once held by sin. You are now held by freedom. Read Ephesians chapter 2. It's all about this idea of, wow, you were dead, to, to dead, dead in your sins and, and trespasses. But now in God, you have life. In fact, his position is, is now your position. That, that in, At the end of chapter 1, uh, Paul says that, that here is Jesus, he's far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, and every name that is named. 
And then Italy, he sits in a position of authority. And then in chapter two, he says, do you know where you're sitting? You are sitting in Christ at the right hand of the Father in that position, which means everything that comes underneath the feet of Jesus now comes under your feet. Why? Because you are an adopted child of God who finds your position in Christ at the right hand of the Father. And you have moved from death unto life. Oh, that's phenomenal. You realize another reality of, the, of this idea of adoption is relationship. That now you can have oneness and intimacy with the living God. See, before we were estranged, we were cut off, we were, we were removed from having relationship with God. But because of the cross and the overwhelming love that God had for us, while we were yet sinners shaking our fists in his face, oh, Christ died for us, which means now we can have relationship, oneness, and intimacy with the living God. And you realize that that relationship then, think about this, because of that relationship, because of the intimacy that you and I have, because we're adopted as children of God, we can now begin to look like our new father. See, it's interesting to me that, that if, you, if you look at a normal adoption, uh, the, the children you adopt in, don't, don't, they don't look like you. Why? Because you're not their biological parent. And yet in the spiritual sense, when we've been adopted in, adopted in as a child of God, we begin to look like our father. We begin to take on his heart and his nature and his character. And what would it look like if I got so tight with Jesus? Oh, what would it look like if, if the relationship and intimacy that I have with him would be so tight that I begin to talk like him and act like him and think like him? And in fact, what would happen if I became so tight with Jesus that I began to look like him? And I understand I don't look like Jesus <laughs> in, in a physical sense. But what would happen if my nature and my character and my attitude and my, my language would be so altered and changed that when someone looked at my life, they would say, you, you look just like Jesus. Oh, I know because I'm adopted and I'm starting to look like my dad. Oh, that's phenomenal, isn't it? And you realize that one of the ways that you can test this adoption, one of these other realities is you can test the adoption. Well, how? Well, are you looking more like your father? Is your life becoming, as verse four says, ever more holy and blameless before him? And you know you're a child of God because you desire sin less and you desire him more and you're beginning to look like him and act like him and think like him and talk like him. Or as verse four would say, you're becoming holy and blameless. And isn't it interesting, just like in the Roman father uh, authority idea, that one of the other realities of this adoption is that you now come under the authority, the, the protection and the provision of your new father. That what was, what was once old, all, all that defined you in the past no longer has a hold on you. God and God alone has a hold on you. You have been adopted as a child of God. And that he has predestined this. This was his longing. This was, this was his craving from the very beginning. In fact, just as he chose you before the foundations of the world, so too he has predestined you for adoption. And get this, Paul goes on and says that all of this is according to the good pleasure of his will. Oh, do you realize that he delights in this? That he is just sitting there going, whoa, you're my child. That this isn't, all right, bummer, I guess I got to bring you in. Oh, I didn't want you, but I guess I got I I to take you. See, there's none of that in the passage. See, this is, man, his longing, his passion, his drive. He's just bubbling forth with excitement. Why? Think about this. He has chosen you before the foundation of the world. That even before he spoke, let there be light, you were on his mind. He was longing for you. He was wanting relationship and intimacy. In fact, he says that he has chosen you before the foundations of the world to be holy and blameless, which is just like him. That he wants you to be just like him. He wants you to have his character and his nature. He, he wants you to, to come in and be just like daddy. And then he says in verse 5 that he has predestined you for adoption. That his longing is, wow, I've, I'm long. Hey, this is, I have predetermined. I, I have chosen you. I predestined you. So you could come in. And all of this is done in love according to the good pleasure of his will. Speaking about his delight. Now, I love this. Verse 6 continues and says, To the praise of the glory of his grace, 
which he graciously bestowed on us in the beloved. Speaking about Jesus. And we're going to be looking at that next time in our next study. Isn't that phenomenal? Well, thank you for joining me for this study. Now, if you'd like to see an outline of this study or read a commentary version, I would encourage you to download all of that at deeperchristian.com forward slash Ephesians 11 for lesson number 11. And just as a reminder, these weekly studies are available in audio format by describing on Apple Podcasts or by visiting deeperchristian.com forward slash Ephesians. Now, until next time, know I am cheering you on as you build your life around the one who has adopted you. See you then.